You may be seated. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Miriam, and worship team. Thank you so much, too, Jan. We just really appreciate you all's ministry to us this morning. It's been wonderful. I'd like to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew 13, and we're going to be looking particularly at verses 31 through 35 this morning. You know, it's easy to fear that Christianity is being extinguished and that Christ's kingdom is diminishing daily. Many of you older folks can remember the time that China uh, was closed off, and then in the last 20 to 30 years, it seemed like it became more tolerant of Christianity. But I was just reading that uh, China is now uh, prohibiting the, Christ the regular practice of Christian funerals, and they're making even the Christians to uh, carry out their funerals. They're conducting burials in their, of their church members in state-prescribed uh, secular mold. Well, in the Muslim world of North Africa, Indonesia, the Middle East, Christians are often oppressed and even slaughtered. And it seems that in Europe, the... Uh, the Church of Jesus Christ is highly unpopular. There's a secular cynicism of agnosticism, and the uh, secularism of atheism is growing, gripping entire nations. Even in Mexico and the Yucatan Peninsula, Christians are being persecuted. And in Canada, our neighbor to the north, the government increasingly seems to restrict pastors from this free expression of adherence to the standards of God. And in our own nation even, it seems that we're increasingly scorned. In fact, to me it almost seems like our nation has become an irrational mob led by highly skilled and manipulative demagogues whose ideology has uh, fatally infected just about every part of our culture. We certainly see here in our own culture the fulfillment of the scriptural prophecy that in the end times, things are going to go from bad to worse. And though we profess to rest in the sovereignty of God, yet it seems that fear often erupts in our hearts and minds. We earnestly pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Yet, when we look at the world around us, we see very, very little evidence that the King of kings and Lord of lords is on the throne. And so our thoughts are dominated so often by dread of impending darkness. But this morning, I'd like to uh, invite you to take a look at two parables that the Lord gave in Matthew 13, 31 through 35, so that we can go from this place this morning back into the world, looking at what's happening from God's perspective. You see, these parables speak of the irresistible power of the kingdom of God. When God sets his kingdom in motion, there is no one who can stand in his way. The power of the kingdom of heaven is unstoppable. I'd like to invite you to stand with me and let's read this portion of scripture together. <clears throat> Matthew 13, 31 through 35. He presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, 
which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds, but when it is fully grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of flour until it was all leavened. All these things Jesus spoke to the crowds in parables, and he did not speak to them without a parable. This is what was spoke to the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things since the foundation of the world. You may be seated. <clears throat> Lord, we just want to acknowledge again that as we open your word, as we look at what you've said, Lord, we need the Spirit of God to be our teacher. And so we ask you, Spirit, that you would open up those things, that we might understand these parables. Lord, I pray that as we understand, we'd come to have restored confidence in you, in spite of what we see going on around us, that we could understand that Jesus is on the throne, that God is sovereign, and that we can trust him fully. I want to thank you for that, for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Those introductory words, Jesus presented another parable to them found in verses 31 and 33, make it appear that these two parables were spoken from that same boat that uh, we saw in the first part of chapter 13, that boat that Jesus went into so he could speak to the big crowds. And then right after the section that we read, we read that Jesus went apart with his disciples and they asked him about the leaven and all. And uh, so it appears that these four parables are kind of tied together. <clears throat> Again, Jesus uses the parables we're looking at this morning to describe the kingdom of God. Remember that the disciples were desperately waiting for that kingdom of God to be revealed. At this point in Jesus' ministry, it was their understanding that the kingdom was to come soon, but at a yet future date. John the Baptist, remember, had preached that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, and Jesus repeated that theme. So the disciples and John the Baptist were looking for evidence that God was indeed on the throne, and that his dominion extended over the earth. Of course, they thought that that first evidence would be that uh, the overthrow of the oppressors of God's people and the imposition of justice in the world. Imagine the consternation that the disciples must have felt when they heard Jesus say, my kingdom is not of this world. How could that be consistent with the prophecy of Psalm 2 that says of Messiah's reign, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give the nations as your inheritance and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You will shatter them like earthenware. I'm sure that they were clinging to that prophecy as they chafed under the yoke of the Romans. <clears throat> but let me assure you that that day is going to come when God's reign will be in its absolute form here on this earth. Messiah will come the second time and will reign with that rod of iron. No evil will be able to withstand his authority. But it wasn't God's time yet for that to happen when Jesus told these parables. 
Jesus was explaining something about the kingdom of heaven that was going on behind the scenes and is still going on behind the scenes today. A simple way of understanding these two parables is that they illustrate the growth of the kingdom. The mustard seed predicting the external growth of the kingdom and the leaven speaking of the kingdom's growing influence. Let's look at these two parables individually then. <clears throat> that parable of the mustard seed is really quite simple. A man planted a tiny mustard seed in a field and it grew into such a big tree that the birds were attracted to nest in its branches. When you're looking at parables, it's always important to identify that one main point uh, that was the reason Jesus told the parable. Here Jesus was predicting that from an insignificant beginning, the kingdom of God would grow large. Now the second parable is also a very, very simple parable. But its interpretation over the years has caused a whole lot more controversy. This parable compares the kingdom of heaven to leaven. <clears throat> leaven in the Bible was a small lump of old dough in a high state of fermentation. The baker would mix it into a mass of dough, and uh, after a time, that little bit of leaven permeated the whole mass of fresh dough being paid, uh, prepared for baking. <clears throat> Jesus' parable speaks of the leaven which a, wim a woman hid in three measures of flour. After a little time, the little bit of leaven permeated the three measures of flour, raising the whole bunch of dough. The measure that the scripture is talking about here Three measures would probably be a little bit over a bushel of flour. A bushel of flour is about 149 cups. It takes around four cups of flour to make a loaf of bread. So it appears that a bushel would make around 37 loaves of bread. But that little bit of leaven permeated the whole bunch of dough that she made out of that flour and raised that dough. It had influence on the whole bushel of flour. It made that whole bushel of flour to rise. Well, many people make the assumption that leaven referred to here speaks of an e evil corrupting influence in the kingdom of heaven. I've heard many people say every time the Bible talks about leaven, it speaks of evil and corruption. This parable cannot be the only exception. You must let Scripture interpret Scripture. And there's no doubt that Scripture needs to interpret Scripture. But it's important to consider all the Scripture before making a dogmatic assertion like that. Leaven is used in different ways in Scripture, and so it seems that one should consider leaven to be a neutral substance as you first start interpreting a parable like this. <clears throat> that it's a neutral substance with inherent properties of infiltrating, and changing any amount of dough into which it is placed. The significance of leaven used metaphorically <coughs> to represent evil can only be determined from the immediate context. I'd like to give you a few examples of the way it is used in Scripture, that leaven is used in Scripture. Once again, in the Old Testament, looking at how leaven was interpreted, it appears to be interpreted as evil. First of all, the leaven was uh, prohibited from being offered directly on the altar. Leviticus 2, 11 and 6, 17. While I recognize that that's true, uh, it may be because leaven is actually a uh, live fun fungi uh, reproducing through budding and um, aceospores so that it ferments carbohydrates. And there was an absolute prohibition of offering anything at all live on the altar. 
For instance, it was commanded that the blood of the sacrificed animal be spilled on the altar, not the animal uh, sacrificed live on that altar. In the New Testament, you see leaven used also in a, in a negative sense. For instance, Jesus warned of the leaven of the Pharisees, Matthew 16, 11. And the Apostle Paul refers to the metaphor of leaven to sin that's tolerated in the fellowship of believers in 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. Yet leaven can also be used in a neutral sense. It's interesting that leaven was prohibited from use in the, in the uh, Passover celebration. But the prohibition of leavened bread during the Passover celebration was not because leaven was the symbol of evil, but the prohibition was designed by God to be a physical reminder of the haste with which Israel left Egypt. Listen to Deuteronomy 16.3, where Moses was giving instruction about the Passover meal. You shall not eat leavened bread with it. Seven days you shall eat with it the unleavened bread, the bread of affliction, for you came out of the land of Egypt in haste, so that you will remember all the days of your life, the day when you came out of the land of Egypt. Unleavened bread is also mentioned in Genesis 19.3 and 1 Samuel 28.24. In the narrative in both cases, that of the angels visiting Lot and Saul at the uh, house of the witch of Endor, someone expectedly had to quickly bake and serve bread. So there was no time for the leaven to rise, raise that bread. Because the bread was served right away, it made absolutely no sense to put leaven into it. But it's interesting that leaven was also used in a positive sense. Unleavened bread was commanded by God for use in Jewish rituals in a positive sense then. Leavened bread was to be presented with the peace offering. We see that in Levit Leviticus 7.13 and Amos 4.5. And two le uh, loaves of the first fruits with leaven were to be presented in the wave offering. Leviticus 23.17. It's instructive to me that God did not prohibit the use of leaven as unclean, but rather prescribed it. For those rituals. Well how then does it uh, affect the way we look at this parable as we consider the different ways in which scripture uses leaven. <clears throat> Especially in this parable we see the interpretation would be closely tied to that of the mustard seed and it seems that we shouldn't just assume that leaven is used in a metaphorical sense to represent an evil influence. Rather, the leaven should be in, in, interpreted as a neutral substance with that inherent property of permeating and causing a transformation in any amount of dough into which it's placed. Notice again the emphasis right there in Scripture given to this parable. First, the leaven is hidden... And after a time, it spreads to every part of the dough. What then is this essence of what Jesus is the essence of what Jesus is saying in this parable? What's the main point? Just as yeast or leaven hidden in dough spreads throughout an entire loaf, there is a substance about the kingdom of heaven which is imperceptibly working true transformation as it extends everywhere. Now that we've looked a little bit at the meaning of these two parables, I'd like to just explore something with you. I'd like to explore the question, what's the fulfillment look like? 
Where do we see this in what God's done? Out in the wilderness, John the Baptist preached, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom was ushered in with the coming of the King of kings and the Lord of lords to this earth. But as Jesus came as a helpless little baby, even though he was worshipped by those kings from the east, guided by a star, he was still that helpless little baby, not much like the King of kings and the Lord of lords. As Jesus grew to become a man with followers, his disciples stumbled over the idea that his kingdom was not an earthly kingdom. They didn't understand what he was about. And it seems that his disciples today have that same problem. Ever since Jesus taught his disciples to pray, those who have put their faith in him have prayed, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. That prayer will ultimately be answered the day that Jesus returns to earth when he does rule with that rod of iron. All the earth is going to be subject to him at that time. It will start with Satan, the prince of this world, being cast into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. But in those early days, Jesus walked with his disciples on Roman roads in Israel. The kingdom was like a mustard seed. For sure, it wasn't any more impressive than the mustard seed which the man planted in the ground. The kingdom didn't start with a big splash with a conqueror arriving on the scene to throw off the Roman oppressors. Jesus and his small band of followers didn't give much visual evidence of a great kingdom. Jesus said to the Pharisees who were questioning when the kingdom would come, the kingdom of God is not coming with signs to be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there it is, for behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. And indeed, the mustard seed was there. But it seemed at that time that the followers of Satan, the God of this world, were much more impressive than Jesus following. But Jesus revealed the truth that on that confession of Peter, that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. That's always seemed like a very, very curious statement to me, that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. You know, I've imagined in my head Satan, maybe with the help of quite a few demons, taking those great big gates of hell, you know, those gates like they'd sit at the, at the entrance to a city, and use that like an offensive weapon. You can imagine them running at you, you know, with the gates over their head kind of ridiculous but gates aren't an offensive weapon you see all kinds of strange offensive weapons like a jawbone of an ass in scripture even but uh, gates are are a defensive weapon there's there's something that that keeps the enemy out so what was jesus saying he was saying that the church would prevail over the best defense that Satan could put up there, that Satan and his world system can mount. This, the world has been given over to Satan's rule, and so the world system bows to Satan's authority. But as Christ's church starts from a mustard seed to become a big tree, it invades Satan's territory, and Satan can do nothing about it. He was defeated at the cross, and it's just a matter of time until Jesus takes full dominion over this earth. Amen. The Apostle Paul explains in Colossians 1.13 that Jesus has rescued those of us who trust in him from the dominion, that is the kingdom, of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Soon after 
the uh, day of Pentecost, there were about 5,000 subjects of King Jesus, primarily from the Jewish community. The good news spread under the ministry of the apostles, even to the Gentiles. So the time of Paul's day, uh, the last days of Paul, the whole known world had come to witness the death had a witness to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Even some of Caesar's household and the Praetorian Guard had come to trust him. Throughout church history and into the modern uh, missionary area, era, in spite of tremendous persecution, the church of Jesus Christ has continued to invade Satan's territory throughout the earth. No gate of religious or civil persecution or prohibition that the enemy could erect has been able to keep the church out. But remember that the kingdom of heaven is also like dough, like that leaven which the woman hid in the dough. It started with something that no one took a notice of, something that was seemingly insignificant, something that was hidden in an insignificant town to an unwed mother, a baby was born who brought life and light to a world that was dying in darkness. As the risen Christ lives in his subjects, his life continues that transformation in everything they touch. His subjects are indeed that salt and light God uses for good in the world because they have the life of Jesus in them. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 17. He says that Christians have that sweet aroma of the knowledge of Christ in every place and are a fragrance of, Je of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, an aroma from death to death, to the other, an aroma from life to life. God's church is made up of those who have the life of Christ in them. Christians have been agents for good all through history because they have the light of Christ in their lives. Christians have influence wherever they go. Think of the rise of scientific inquiry by Christians like Newton, Pasteur, Kepler, Pascal, Fleming, who discerned a sense of order in the universe ruled by God and recognized that mandate given by God to man to exercise dominion in the physical world. So many positive social movements have their uh, roots in the Christian regard for the dignity of each individual as created by God. Education is a great example. At a time when there was no way the peasant was going to have any education, 95% of the pilgrims were literate. That was something unheard of at the time. 100 of the first 110 universities founded in America were founded to train students to propagate Christianity. Christian missionaries founded the educational systems of China, Korea, and Japan, and many other countries. Christians have had a tremendous influence in music throughout the centuries, through composers like Handel and Bach, as well as church musicians, like we have right here, who've learned to play instruments and sing in a way that will enhance the worship of God in the congregation of believers. The abolition of slavery came about through the efforts of Christians of conscience, men like Wilberforce and Lincoln. Church history tells us that the early Christians stood in opposition to infanticide, degradation of women, gladiator combats, slavery, things like that. Prison reform, labor reform, Reform in the treatment of women and, and uh, orphans have all been led by Christians. But the most dramatic change comes when a Christian shares that good news 
of life in Jesus Christ and a wandering sister uh, or sinner, wandering sister or brother, sinner, either way, comes to faith in Jesus Christ. My wife Cheryl's parents started a small Bible study in a little town called Llano Grande, 11,000 feet up in the Venezuelan Andes. In a few years, their fellow missionaries, John and Annabel Van Campen, uh, came and they, they uh, continued this small church plant. When John and, Bell and, Anna, uh, uh, John and Annabel <clears throat> arrived in Llano Grande, it was really a dark, dark place. Ambushes were fairly common with murder being the intent and the in inevitable result. Cheryl's dad, in fact, was ambushed three times by people who hated his gospel witness, but God miraculously delivered him from harm each time. That's a story for another time. But it was almost as if the Hatfields and McCoys and all their cousins were all over in that community. Drunkenness and immorality were the uh, main sources of entertainment on those cold, foggy nights. But people wouldn't go home after their partying. No one wanted to go out at night because it was too dangerous. You could very likely get killed. As the gospel was preached <clears throat> and people came to faith in Christ, the leaven started to permeate that community. But Jesus Christ was working in a way that almost no one would notice at first. Just one more person came to faith in Christ, and then one more. Starting at one, at one at a time, lives were changed by the Spirit indwelling the believers. So it wasn't too many years <clears throat> before the Christians built a meeting place and started walking in groups to be able to meet at night after the day's work. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 5.17 says that if any one is in Christ. He's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And the Christian's testimony there in Llano Grande was potent proof of the power of the gospel to change lives completely. Where one consistently sees drunkenness, anger, lust, malice, vengeance, and murder, those Christian virtues like forgiveness, restitution, peace, and Christian love are tremendously hard to resist. Soon the whole community was going out to, at night to the church to be with their brothers and sisters in Christ. <clears throat> I, was, I remember one time when I was at the church and sitting there on the church bench, they didn't have backs and didn't have cushioned seats, but there were just benches, uh, sitting there on a bench was a murderer, and then the rest of the bench was taken up by the victim's family. Uh, nobody in the church thought that was unusual. This is exactly what was expected when Christ's life, when his kingdom permeates a community. I'd like to just uh, have you consider just for a minute what I like to call the so what factor. You know, what difference does this make? So what? So what difference should this make in our lives? How does seeing things from God's perspective change our lives? I'd like to suggest two ways to you. First, we can live fearless, faith-filled lives when we understand that Jesus' kingdom is unstoppable. We don't have to lose sleep over that e evil generation around us. We don't have to cower before our corrupt culture. Jesus' kingdom will grow because he said that Satan and this world system are powerless against the power of God in Jesus' followers. <clears throat> 
Don't you love it that because your faith is in Jesus, that your heart can really resonate with that song Jan sang for us. The Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? I don't have to fear. The Lord's my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom then shall I be afraid? When I know these things, and God uses that knowledge so that I'm loving God with my mind as I choose to trust him. My emotions quit ruling then. I'm loving God, not just with my heart, but with my mind. As I understand what he said about his kingdom. Yes, it's hidden. Yes, it's still growing. But look where it's going. And I'm loving God with my mind as I put my trust in him. As my mind rules my commitment, not my emotions. The second thing I'd like to suggest is that we not neglect the gospel presentation undergirded by prayer. As we share that good news of life in Jesus Christ at home, at work, and at school, God answers our prayer as his power is released. The Spirit of God opens the hearer's eyes, gives them the gifts of repentance and faith, and God rescues them from the dominion of darkness and transfers them to the kingdom of his Son. Jesus' kingdom that started out like a mustard seed continues to grow, and like leaven, it has influence everywhere. Let's go to the Lord in prayer again. <clears throat> Father, how thankful we are that this is your word. Lord, no matter how it's presented, no matter how, uh, no matter how, how little our understanding, Lord, you've written this. It was your parable. Lord, that we've been looking at this morning. And so, Lord, uh, I pray that we might commit to believe, that we might live in that commitment, that you would be glorified, Lord, through our lives. And, Lord, as, as your church, as we leave this place, I pray that, indeed, our our attitude would be changed about what's going on around us and we com commit to believing because of what you've spoken and then Lord may our lives as the fruit of the spirit is on display day after day may our lives be attractive in adorning that gospel message that we proclaim. Thank you, Lord, that we can trust completely that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You are dismissed.